Hello, and welcome to this fifth webinar in our Transition to Transplant series. Today we have Kenneth Wu from St. Michael's Hospital and Lisa Wickerson from the University Health Network with us today to speak about physiotherapy and exercise in patients with cystic fibrosis undergoing a lung transplant. At the end of the talk, there will be an opportunity to ask questions via phone or via the chat feature on the right-hand panel of the screen. Kenneth and Lisa, thank you for joining us today, and I'll pass it over to you to start today's talk. Okay. Um, so the learning objective of this presentation is um, for the, the learner should be able to recognize the importance of airway clearance, habitual physical activities and exercise in end-stage cystic fibrosis. Discuss evidence-based practice for counseling and treatment of airway clearance and physical activities for people with CF. And to also identify treatment modifications to optimize airway clearance and physical status in people with advanced disease, variables, disease stability, and comorbidity in CF. So this, state, this table shows some of the changes with advanced disease in CF. And people with, with advanced disease in CF, they may have more frequent pulmonary exacerbations, res respiratory complications like hemoptysis, pneumothorax, um, hypoxemia, hypercapnia, fatigue, chronic headache, and other comorbidity like osteoporosis, postural alterations, joint pain, and cystic fibrosis-related disease, uh, diabetes. And also, they will have less or, or worsening pulmonary function and, and nutritional status, and, and also the level of physical activity, skeletal muscle mass, skeletal muscle strength, and also exercise capacity. So what are the implications for airway clearance therapy, physical activity counseling, and exercise training in this stage? Airway clearance is Key, is a key element in the management of cystic fibrosis throughout the lifespan. The aim of, cystic, uh, clear, uh, the aim of airway clearance therapy is to clear sputum from airways in order to de decrease the obstructions in airways, improve ventilation and gas exchange. Consequently, slow disease progression, improve functional capacity, and ultimately enhance health-related quality of life. Airway clearance therapy is frequently described as the cornerstone of CF treatment. So, a number of effective airway clearance techniques are available. The first one is conventional chest physiotherapy. This includes postural drainage. Um, in CF now, we're using modified postural drainage and percussion. Sometimes vibration and other um, manual chest techniques are added as well. The second is active cycle of breathing techniques, which involve which involve um, sorry, which involve breathing control, thoracic expansion exercise, and force expiratory techniques. They are done in cycles. Autogenic drainage is a breathing exercise where patients are instructed to breathe in different lung volumes with a high velocity of expiratory airflow to move the secretion of the airways. In positive expiratory pressure, PEP, and the, they would use the PEP device um, to help um, generate positive intraluminal pressure during expiration. And the pictures on the top here shows a TheraPEP device, which is one of the, the PEP devices we have available. Oscillating PEP incorporates PEP with oscillations and intermittent accelerations of expiratory airflow to move the secretion. And the, sec the one uh, below the TheraPEP is a, is a flutter device, and that's uh, one of the, the uh, oscillating PEP uh, device that we have. And this flutter on top is also another oscillating PEP device. Now, there are more recently there are a lot of interest and still debatable to use 
um, aerobic type exercise to replace airway clearance therapy sessions. This will be further discussed later in this presentation. Note that there's no strong evidence to show that there's any airway clearance techniques is superior to another. So now we're going to talk about um, different complications um, with airway clearance therapy. Hemoptysis is a common occurrence in patients with CF. Major hemoptysis occur more frequently as the CF disease progresses. Hemoptysis is typically classified into mild, moderate, and mass massive or severe. Mild hemoptysis is defined as coughing up blood streaking or less than 5 milliliters and less than 15 milliliters of blood in 24 hours. In the consensus guideline, during the mild hemoptysis, it is inappropriate to stop airway clearance therapy. Thus, the patient should continue the usual airway clearance technique. And they're recommended to avoid paroxysm of coughing. Because mild hemoptysis is often associated with pulmonary exacerbations, we recommend increased frequency of airway clearance therapy. Mild, uh, moderate hemoptysis is defined as coughing up more than 50 mil or less than 250 milliliters in 24 hours of blood. It was suggested moderate hemoptysis is not life threatening and that successful clearance of airway secretions is critical in the resolution of underlying process progression. And in general, conventional chest physiotherapy, PEP and oscillating PEP should be used with caution. And the author in the consensus had least concerns with the ACPT and autogenic drainage for hemoptysis. So that's what we would recommend to patients when they have moderate hemoptysis. Massive hemoptysis is defined, is defined as coughing up more than 250 ml of blood in 24 hours. Forming, the cl forming a clot in the site of bleeding is believed to be important to stop the hemoptysis. Some, of the, some have expressed concern about airway clearance therapy may impair clot formation and adherence, resulting in more bleeding. Hence, patients with massive hemoptysis are recommended to stop all airway clearance therapy until the active bleeding has resolved. If the patient can feel where the hemoptysis is, positions the patient with the blood bleeding side down uh, would be recommended. Um, if the patient cannot tell, then the patient should be positioned in an upright supportive position. And um, they should continue um, as per moderate hemoptysis with, with consultation with medication, medically, um, medical team recommendations. Pneumothorax is another complication that may have with advanced disease. Pneumothorax is defined as the presence of air within the pleural space. It can be pro can be a problem in people with cystic fibrosis as the, as the collapsed lung can be stiff and take longer to re expand. Pneumothoraces occur more frequently in patients with more advanced disease in CF. Some pneumo small pneumothoraces is defined as one does not need require does not require intercostal drainage. Usually, patients are asymptomatic. The consensus. It does not recommend people with small pneumothorax to stop airway clearance therapy. We recommend patients with small pneumothoraxes to avoid any positive um, pressure and thus stop the PEP and oscillating PEP. And we recommend them to, take, to continue ACBT and autogenic drainage or autogenic drainage and perform gentle huffing and coughing. We have done percussion therapy on the unfected side as well, and we should continue to monitor patients' respiratory status. Large hemoptysis is when intercostal drainage is needed. 
If undrained, temporary stopped all the airway clearance techniques. When it's drained, the management is quite similar to the one with small pneumothorax. Adequate airway clearance should be continued while minimizing the amount of positive pressure generating inside the patient's lung and stop the PEP and oscillating PEP as well. Um, again, uh, we we'll start and continue or continue ACBT or autogenic drainage and also gentle huffing and coughing techniques. Again, we have done percussion therapy on, on the infected side um, for patients as well. Pain management is important during airway clearance therapy. Patients may be taught how to do supported or splinted coughing. So for some patients, chemical or surgical pleurodesis is needed to manage the pneumothorax. Post post uh, post disease, patients are recommended to continue with ACBT or autogenic drainage, gentle huffing and coughing as well. We may gradually reintroduce the other airway clearance techniques when necessary. Again, pain can be an issue post prosthesis, um, post uh, disease. Does pain this pain management during airway clearance techniques uh, therapy is very important. They may be taught supported and splinted coughing techniques. Finally, early mobilization should be encouraged. Other complications include fatigue and also headache. Uh, with advanced disease, patients may feel very tired from increased work of breathing and is unable to perform independent airway clearance therapy. Although independent airway clearance therapy is often, of, always emphasized, uh, we may need to resume conventional chest physiotherapy during this time. It is also important to be more flexible and balance resting airway clearance therapy and other CF treatments as well. In advanced disease with CF, hypoxemia and or hypercapnia may occur. Patient may experience chronic disease as a result. In order for patient to tolerate airway clearance therapy, adequate pain management is vital. While patient may be on BiPAP at this stage, we may consider doing a percussion therapy while patient is using the BiPAP, which may facilitate airway clearance as well. We may also consider using breathing control to help patient relaxation, to relax. All in all, during advanced disease in CF, flexibility is very important. We may need to consider modifying airway clearance technique, consider shorter and more frequent airway clearance therapy sessions. Also, it is vital to maintain communication continuously and frequently with the CF medical team and as well as our uh, transplant center counterpart. Now, Lisa, our trans transplant center counterparts, will discuss about physical activity and exercise. Okay. Thank you, Kenneth. So, physical activity, uh, it's defined as any bodily movement by skeletal muscles that increases energy expenditure above the resting metabolic rate. And it is really a broad concept and it includes many different types of activities. Exercise is one component and it's defined as a, a plan, structure and repetitive movement uh, to improve or maintain physical fitness. And that includes both cardiorespiratory and musculoskeletal fitness. Physical activity is reduced early in the CF disease process and does decline uh, further with age. Specifically, there's less time spent in moderate to vigorous activity. Individuals with CF spend a lot of time lying and sitting, and they may not be engaged in work, school, or household chores, or may have stopped doing as much physical activity after experiencing a disease exacerbation or progression. And it's important to counsel people to tailor their activity, but not to stop it altogether. Physical inactivity is a main contributing factor to reduce muscle mass, strength, and endurance, and is especially seen in the lower limbs. 
and increased physical activity is linked to physical fitness in CF. There are both objective and subjective measures of physical activity. The self-report habitual activity estimate scale is one of the most common, and physical activity diaries are useful to screen physical activity levels and to generate discussion about physical activity patterns. The recommendation for physical activity in, in CF is 60 minutes per day of moderate to vigorous activity. This would be where people would feel their breathing would be getting somewhat harder, but they could still talk. An example would be brisk walking. Increased physical fitness and exercise capacity is associated with many important outcomes in CF, including decreased mortality, slower rate of decline in pulmonary function, improved cardiovascular risk factors and body composition, higher bone mineral density, and health-related quality of life. The primary functional outcome is a six-minute walk test to measure functional exercise capacity. At our transplant center, it is used to determine uh, transplant eligibility and waitlist status, uh, track functional changes, assess effectiveness of various interventions, and is used as a guide for exercise prescription. For example, using 70 to 80 percent of the six-minute walk test speed for treadmill training intensity. And additional measures of muscle strength and functional mobility may also be used. According to expert consensus, individuals with CF should engage in both aerobic and resistance exercise. For aerobic exercise, moderate to vigorous activity, 70% of max heart rate is recommended. This can be calculated by using the 220 minus the age equation or use a percentage of heart rate achieved on an exercise test, such as a six-minute walk test or a cardiopulmonary exercise test. In addition to increasing cardiorespiratory fitness and muscle endurance and strength, exercise also increases ventilatory demands, and this thereby increases ventilation and peak expiratory flows that can increase mucus propulsion. Exercise has traditionally been considered an adjunct to airway clearance. However, there are some studies, as Kenneth alluded to earlier, examine if exercise in conjunction with independent expiratory maneuvers, such as coughing or huffing, can successfully substitute for an airway clearance session. In end-stage CF, it may be challenging to obtain 30 to 60 minutes of moderate aerobic intensity due to severe ventilatory restriction and dyspnea. And exercise has to be individualized and adapted to disease severity, disease stability, and CF-related comorbidities. Exercise prescription can be modified to include intermittent, shorter, and more frequent bouts. It can start with lower intensity and build up the duration before increasing the intensity of exercise. Individuals may not be able to meet the heart rate target, and monitoring for oxygen saturation and symptoms of dyspnea and leg fatigue using a rating of perceived exertion or Borg scale can, may be needed to guide exercise prescription and response. And at our center, we use a Borg scale of three to four or moderate to somewhat severe. If individuals experience exertional hypoxemia, they should be given supplemental oxygen to support exercise intensity and duration, typically maintaining an oxygen saturation of greater or equal to 88% with exertion. There are some studies investigating non-invasive ventilation, such as BiPAP with exercise training. However, this is not a standard clinical practice in our outpatient rehab setting. Individuals with CF may be admitted to the intensive care unit for respiratory failure pre-transplant and require mechanical ventilation and or extracorporeal life support. In these cases, individuals who are medically stable and cognitively capable will work with our critical care mobility team to maintain mobility. Cycles attached to the bed or at the bedside may be used, along with resistance exercises, which have a lower ventilatory demand. Lower limb strengthening is targeted for anticipation of early ambulation post-transplant. As Kevin, uh, Kenneth mentioned, uh, regular airway clearance is important, especially to reduce airway obstruction and to improve, improve ventilatory capacity during exercise. General consensus is to stop exercise if there is hemophysis 
and resume 24 to 48 hours following the bleed. Vigorous exercise should be avoided if there is a small pneumothorax, and no upper limb weights are used for two weeks following the resolution of a large pneumothorax. Optimal caloric intake is needed to compensate for the increased energy expenditure during exercise, as well as adequate hydration and salt replacement. Musculoskeletal physiotherapy may be needed for joint pain or in postural re-education. And the avoidance of ballistic exercise and vigorous trunk extension, flexion, and rotation is recommended if significant osteoporosis is present and the avoidance of contact sporting activities. Glucose monitoring before, during, and after exercise is also recommended in CF-related diabetes. Since exercise is mandatory for, at our center for the duration of the wait list for transplant to optimize and maintain fitness for surgery, it is helpful if people are already engaging in exercise as part of their medical care before they're listed for transplant. A higher six-minute walk distance is associated with better survival on the transplant wait list and improved post-transplant outcomes. Exercise is also important following transplant. Although the ventilatory limitations to exercise are relieved, there are peripheral limitations to exercise, as well as an increased risk of cardiovascular morbidity. Both pre- and post-transplant strict infection control guidelines are adhered to in terms of physical separation of CF patients who are exercising and cleaning of exercise equipment and monitors. And we have published an evidence-informed clinical approach to exercise training pre- and post-transplant for an additional reference as listed here. Finally, participation in the Canadian and World Transplant Games are encouraged post-transplant to encourage healthy living and participation. And the Cam Restore website it also has additional information on optimizing health and physical activity before and after transplant. Thank you very much. Thank you, Kenneth and Lisa. We are now open for questions. You can use the raise the hand feature uh, that you can find next to your name on the right-hand side, and I can unmute you if you'd like to ask the question over the phone, or you can use the chat feature, which is also on the right-hand side, to type in your questions, and I can moderate those as well. So not seeing any questions come in, we can conclude the webinar here. The webinar has been recorded and will be posted up on the healthcare section of Cystic Fibrosis Canada's website, and that's located under the Transition to Transplant tab. The recording should be available next week. You can also see all of our upcoming webinars on our website, and the registration will be emailed as future webinars are scheduled. So thank you again to Kenneth and Lisa and to everyone that attended today's session.